that this is a syndrome that we see truly in critical illness and that we're really only confident about in patients who have either severe sepsis or septic shock. So I think we don't really, in general practice and even in specialty practice, we don't see this very often. It's really uncommon. Um, and we see it basically, you can, you can gauge how often you're going to see this syndrome in dogs and probably cats and foals based on how often you are treating an animal that has systemic inflammation so severe to lead them to be hypotensive secondary to a severe infection um, uh, and develop multiple organ failure and things of that nature. So they have to be really, really sick. This is not a syndrome that we would expect to see in an animal that it's standing up. <laughs> you know, put, put plainly, if it's standing up, looking around, eating, chances are very good that Cirque is not in its, uh, in its realm. So um, it's something that, that in specialty practice, I probably saw this, I'm going to guess, in I thought maybe one out of every five, one out of every four animals that was severely septic. Um, Severe sepsis being uh, organs failing and low blood pressure and elevated lactate secondary to a bad infection. So um, I probably was still only recognizing it in maybe, you know, at the most, maybe a third of the, that population of patients. I may be under recognizing it um, based on some of the study data we had, but um, that was really as, as often as I felt like I was seeing it. So um, that would be the first thing I would say is that it's uncommon. And so then take, to take it from there, uh, how do I decide whether or not to, to treat basically their hypotension with steroids? I think really is the question. How do you decide whether to do it or not? Well. We don't know the answer in dogs, cats, or horses. Um, I have I don't treat horses, so I've only ever had to make the decision in dogs and cats. Historically, I have used a standard ACTH stimulation test to help guide my therapy, but um, I think that there's, based on the human literature, not a lot of, um, I don't really have a lot of evidence to do that anymore um, based on what they do. and so. As time has gone by, I've been more and more likely to take patients who had severe uh, hypotension that I was confident had had enough fluids and were no longer or not at all responsive to pressure therapy. And if, I, if that's the situation we're in, we have a fluid-loaded dog or cat who has um, a poor response to pressors, I'm pretty likely to go ahead and at least try. Uh, half a mg per kg to one mg per kg of hydrocortisone IV every six hours. Um, I have used the CRI. I've both used the CRI and intermittent injections, and I have not personally noticed a difference. I don't know about you, Melissa, how, what you may have noticed in practice if you've done one or the other or both. Um, I have not per per personally noticed a difference. And we managed to publish a case report on one dog where we did it intermittently and did get that dog off pressors and it went home and did fine. So, um, I'm, you know, have some confidence in that method if, in fact, you don't have a syringe pump on hand. Also, another question people will oftentimes ask me about this syndrome is, hey, we don't carry hydrocortisone in our clinic, which most clinics don't carry hydrocortisone because you don't need it very often. Uh, it's, not, it's not convenient to send home with clients. Uh, it's not what's ever chosen by a surgeon to use for a back. It's, it's a drug that we just don't often have on the shelf unless you have a criticalist who has an interest in this particular topic. So can I use prednisone or prednisolone? And the answer to that is probably yes. Um, you just need to remember to scale your dose. So the total dose using uh, interject intravenous prednisone, prednisolone um, would be a quarter of the hydrocortisone dose. So you would only use one mg per kg total per day rather than one mg per kg per dose every six hours. So, <clears throat> but you would dose it like pred. So you would use it every, twice a day, not four times a day, but you might give it, say, half a mg per kg IV twice a day. Depending on the size of the animal then, you're oftentimes buying like a whole bottle of 
solumedrol and having to waste large amounts of it because the bottles are designed for humans and you're using it in some tiny, like, Yorkie or something like that. Um, so that is an unfortunate consequence of, of the drug preparations that I have seen anyway as far as the injectable prednisones. But, um, but I have used both prednisone and hydrocortisone for this indication, and it's my impression that they are basically largely equivalent. There's a, a case report in a cat that used dexamethasone, and that was, a, I believe, a successful case as well. So um, again, you would dose, you would change your dose, you would scale your dose. Um, so then, like a tenth of the pred dose would be what you would be giving, since dexamethasone is ten times as potent as pred. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind. But hydrocortisone is the gold standard for treatment. I generally use it if I have a pressor-resistant, fluid-loaded hypotensive animal uh, in front of me. And if you don't have hydrocortisone, you can probably use prednisone or dex. Thanks, Jamie. That's, I think, great information. And just to, to add to some of your comments, um, I would agree. I think that even as a critical care specialist, this is an uncommon disease that we see. I probably, uh, we have a specialty hospital with a full-time ER, and I, I probably use it a handful of times a year, if that. And I would say that I will sometimes preferentially use the CRI just for um, decreasing the injection fees at our hospital, um, but really just becomes a matter of cost to the client. Um, but I have not personally seen a difference between the two methods. And I, I think it's important to just make sure um, if you are going to purchase hydrocortisone, which I think it is a, a relatively inexpensive drug, but in general practice, you may not have a need for it. Um, just be sure that you're getting the right preparation. I think just recently we had a, a patient that was in that had um, inadvertently been given the Salyut Delta Cortex, um, which I think in, if I'm um, correct, is not the same as the uh, Salyumedrol. So um, just be sure to get the right preparation and um, use that accordingly. But I think that it's, as, you, as we see more and more of these patients, there are the patients that I do see respond that are not responding to traditional therapies, that are not responding to oppressor support. Um, and I think pretty quickly the ones that are going to respond, you usually see that response, um, you know, shortly after the, the first or second dose. So in those patients, it has worked out nicely. I think one of the follow-up questions that I always have is in those patients that are responding to the hydrocortisone, um, Jamie, in your opinion, what do you do to send those patients home? Do you do a taper pred dose, or do you try to taper them off in the hospital? What's your experience with that? Um, personally, I have sent them home on low doses of prednisone. Uh, I've generally tapered at home. I have not been in a hurry to taper them as long as they're not having any untoward side effects, uh, which I've never seen any myself, knock on wood, that I've, like, recognized anyway. Um, so as long as they're not having any um, prednisone side effects, I have kept them on a low dose of up to a mg per kg per day pred equivalent while they're in the hospital. Get them home, get them to the point where they're eating really well for you and in general seem to be feeling good and their owner would tell you, hey, Fido looks normal to me. Um, and then I would start to wean them. I will say though that I do that just because um, for no, for no good reason. I do that for, for my personal bias of um, not knowing when to do it. So um, the human guidelines don't have any guidelines either. The only guideline that they have on the human side is that they do recommend tapering. They don't recommend abruptly stopping the um, steroid, but they don't even make any specific tapering recommendations, and I do not know what people usually get as far as their personal taper. Now, humans are oftentimes in the hospital much, much longer than dogs and cats, so I'm pretty confident that their taper is happening entirely in the hospital. Uh, but I would be surprised if it were happening over a time, a time period shorter than about a week. And that's what I've generally done is like at the one, you know, a few day recheck if they're doing great or a one week recheck if they're doing great, then I, then I start the standard pred taper. Of, you know, now we're going to just once a day dosing for three or four days and then every, and then, uh, every other day dosing for three or four doses and then stop. Okay, good. Yeah, I would agree. That's pretty, pretty similar to what we're doing is tapering them off. I, I will say N of one, but we had a pretty um, crazy case as a resident that I was a severe septic patient that was a 
second time septic abdomen. And I, I just remember that patient, as we were tapering it, um, seemed to have some signs of um, adrenal insufficiency, again, where the, the dog just was kind of not himself, he was lethargic, wasn't acting right, and we ended up having to go up on the, back up on the dose and do a slower taper. And that's the only case that I can remember, and, and who knows, I mean, we did have a, a SIM test that was done that showed that the patient was still consistently um, low, um, and we did have, luckily, in that patient follow-up data to show that it um, eventually the patient had a full response. Um, but again, that's one patient. There could have been certainly many other factors, but I, I think that there is evidence, at least right now, clinically, to not cold turkey those, those steroids. Yeah. So I'm not in a rush to do that. <laughs> you got to write that out, Melissa. <laughs> yeah, definitely. In, in my free time, I will, for sure. <laughs> but it, it is it is interesting. I think as we as we start start to see more and more of these cases and learn more, even just even from the human aspect, um, I think this would be a great multi center study to eventually um, take on board, especially with the trauma um, register coming out. I think that there might be some other avenues where we could hopefully get some more evidence behind a lot of this, and in, in, at least um, cats and dogs, and eventually hopefully equine as well. Yeah, that would be great. We we did try a multi-center study on this, um, mm -hmm. and it we happened to start it right, I think we started it in like 2007, so then the economy um, died, and so did everyone's willingness to treat their dogs with this terrible disease. So um, the terrible disease being the severe sepsis and septic shock. So we only recruited eight animals from eight institutions over the course of like three years was really sad. Um, well, because also the exclusion list for a study like that is really long. You know, they have to have had no steroids for a long period of time before right. and they have to accommodate. There's just, there's a very long list of things. But um, I, would, I would think it would be wonderful to get a multi-center trial um, successfully accomplished on this because we really just don't have a lot of information.